it's now my pleasure to to hand over to before we go into the break to Dr. Anand Sagar uh, or Sagar. I'm I'm never quite sure how to pronounce your surname. I do apologize. Jane, Jane with you, as long as it's polite, it's fine. Anything's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Saga, Saga. Can I can I just uh, can I just remind everybody uh, who who may have just joined us to when asking your questions, if you use the Q&A uh, facility rather than chat. So the Q&A facility can be found either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. And it's sort of, you'll, you, can, you can identify that with the two speech, uh, speech bubble symbols. Uh, so welcome everybody, um, anybody that's just, just joined us. Um, as I say, I'm gonna hand you over to Dr. Anand Sagar, Sagar. Uh, who is a clinical geneticist and also one of the founders of the PKD charity, actually now 20 years ago. We're about to celebrate uh, in a couple of weeks our 20th anniversary. So it's a real pleasure that, uh, to have you here today. Over to you. Okay, so if I can get this done right, share screen. Yeah, we've been practicing this. Uh, is that, are we there now? Can you see? Can you see it? We can see your screen. You just you now need to, just need to open up your presentation. Yeah. Um, slideshow. No. Play from start. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So. And then you need to open it up again. Yeah. I'm doing that. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. You're, you're absolutely perfect. Fine. Okay. So w welcome uh, everyone. I mean, it's a strange world, but in some ways, doing this by Zoom and things uh, gives a great uh, benefit to many people who can't normally make it to these uh, uh, talks and meetings when we've had them over the many years in the charity. And indeed, I'm very honoured to be speaking, particularly given it's 20 years coming up. So I'm grateful, certainly, for the previous speaker because he's covered some of the things, and so that gives me time to just uh, move through some of the slides quite quickly. Uh, I also was asked, as was said earlier, to give this talk at short notice. And um, so I, because of other commitments, I wasn't able to prepare my own set of slides. And I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Um, um, don't have a senior moment, Dick. Uh, I've forgotten Dick's uh, surname. Um, never mind. Richard Sanford, Dick Sanford. Dick, Dick Sanford, Dick, Dick Sanford in Cambridge, because it's his talk and I'm just sort of borrowing his slides. So I'm grateful to that. Um, okay, so now we should go to the next slide. So I'm just going to try and cover some points and obviously try and uh, uh, um, answer things as we go along as well where I can. And Jane's hopefully going to remind me of some of the questions because multitasking uh, may be difficult with all the sort of questions that are coming in. Um, there are lots of different types of genetic testing. The inheritance pattern's been covered. I do want to talk about why genetic testing might be offered and when and what the results mean because some people are getting results they don't necessarily know as being definitely abnormal and some people get disappointed when they get a result that says there's nothing found and they get confused as to whether that means they still have dominant polycystic kidney disease or not and a few of the issues about confidentiality and testing children um well, I'm going to click. I saw clicking seems to work. So there are obviously lots and lots of different types of genetic testing on the market. And um, uh, you get ancestry testing, there's lifestyle testing, where you're just looking at variations in different ways of spelling the genes, but they're not what we call classical Mendelian high penetrance genes. Um, and then we've obviously been doing paternity type of testing for a long time, crime identification. But I'm really involved as a genetics doctor looking at disease diagnosis. We call genes which have got high penetrance, penetrance being the ability to come through the body to produce symptoms. And obviously, if you have a diagnosis, you have a prognosis. And also you can look at uh, predictive testing for people who might be at risk in the future for adult onset conditions, pertinent very clearly for dominant polycystic kidney disease where you don't often get problems as a baby. In fact, you, you largely don't. There's only 2% where they might present with very severe problems as a, as a neonate 
and she's a, a less than one year old. So um, carrier testing is not relevant for polycystic kidney disease because it's mostly for recessive disorders. So it's relevant for those people who have families with autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. And clearly if both parents are carriers, then there would be a 25% chance they could have an affected baby. But I'm not gonna talk about that really today. And obviously the issue of pregnancy and some people wanting IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, or prenatal testing by what we call a CVS, where you test the placenta. So um, we've got, as has been said already, uh, autosomal dominant, which is the pattern of inheritance, polycystic kidney disease. It's a bad term, poly meaning many, cysts in the kidney, but it's a multi-system disorder. And I know that there were some questions asked about it being a connective tissue disorder. Well, it is. Um, we've known for many, many years that it's, there are, there's something wrong with the sort of cell-cell adhesion, the way that cells put, uh, sort of stick together. And that's to some extent why the cysts form. It also controls the regulation and the duplication of the cells, which is why they multiply to become many cells that form a sort of a, a ball, which then becomes the lining of the cyst. And we also know that there's been these aneurysms, the swelling on the brain uh, of vessels, which is again a stretch of the cells that then expand. Um, there's also been an increased incidence of hernias in people who've been on CAPD, where you fill up the fluid in the belly and they have a higher incidence of hernias. There's also 20%, 25% will have a floppy mitral valve in the heart. Um, and certainly um, in my experience, when we were doing a lot of uh, fistula fashioning in the arms, we used to, the surgeons used to complain when they had to do PKD patients, because they said that they get a lot of vascular spasm and the fistulas are much harder to fashion and to make because they would shut down. And there's been some reports as well of people in the old days when they were putting needles into the neck of vessels to look for aneurysms. Um, they would say that they're going to spasm and have migraines or, or temporary strokes. So lots of evidence that it's a connective tissue disorder. And as the previous speaker said, we've now understand the genetics, that it's actually the way that the gene is in one of the uh, cell, uh, the, the cellular compartments called the cilia, that in some way controls cell-cell adhesion. So we're now making sense at the genetic level of what we knew from a clinical level. What most PKD patients don't get, however, is the sort of classical joint laxity, the sort of hypermobility and bendiness and stretchiness in their joints and ligaments that we see in other people who are said to be hypermobile. So I hope that answers that question. I'm not gonna, you'll see on the side, I'm not gonna talk about patterns of inheritance because that's been established. I just, again, wanted to just reiterate what was said about the pattern of inheritance. It can affect males and females equally. You only need one copy of the gene. And the P I often get asked in the clinic, you know, can the gene skip a generation? Well, no, the gene can't skip a generation. If you have the gene, there's a 50-50 chance you pass it on. If you don't have the gene, you can't pass it on. Now, I want to be pedantic with myself here. It's not the gene, because we all have the PKD genes. It's how they're spelt. So if you have the misspelling in the gene, that is what you pass down. So if you've got, and I know one person asked about, if you've got PKD1, can you then get PKD2? Well, no, it's a short answer. If you've got that particular spelling, there's a 50-50 chance you'll pass down that same particular spelling. If your relative has got a different spelling in the gene, then either they're not your relative or there was something wrong in the analysis, or there's been a spontaneous a new mutation occurring, but that would be less likely. So, but whilst the gene can't skip generations, the manifestations can be highly variable and it can be seeming or apparent that they haven't got it when actually they have. There was a very large study uh, in, 60, in, uh, in the late eighties from the Olmsted County. Uh, and they found that probably up to 50% of people would live and die without manifesting any clinical problems, but they had lots and lots of cysts in their kidneys when they died. 
So um, that was a very strange population that Olmsted County in the USA because they gave free health insurance to everyone, providing they would always turn up to have a medical and that they would um, uh, allow a post-mortem when they died. So there was a slightly biased population, I think, that never left and probably st stayed and married people in the same community. Who knows? Anyway, we've got to take that with some caution, but there are definitely people who don't manifest symptoms. You've heard again about the PKD1 and PKD2. The only relevant bit I want to is point out here on the third line that there have been at least three new genes now identified through the 100,000 Genome Project when we've sequenced the whole genome. They are rare. They account for probably no more than 1% of patients. And I've got uh, two patients now in my own practice at St. George's who've got um, this first gene as the, as a, in their family. Um, the more east you go in the world, particularly Korea, it's thought to be about 20% of families will have PKD2 uh, as a gene, which as has been said, is a later onset condition by about 16 years. They still get all the same problems. You still get aneurysms and hypertension. It's just 16 years later. And once you've got it, and if you progress, it's still the same rate of progression. It just starts later. So of course, if you're using the classical diagnostic criteria of numbers of cysts in PKD2, you can't be quite so certain at a young age that they won't then later get the cysts and you have to recheck. Um, I, what do we mean by genetic testing? Well, I, I, I don't really have time to go through the details of how we undertake testing and the analysis. But suffice it to say, the gene has various parts in it called the exons, which are the bits that you take out to make the protein here on the RNA side. And the introns, the bits you leave behind uh, in the sequencing code, are the regulatory elements. And there's no doubt that some of these regula regulatory elements will make a difference as to how uh, the genes are split and also probably how genes are expressed. And the protein is made up of the individual amino acids, which are the Lego pieces. So the RNA here, along its coding sequence, will ask in three letter words for a particular Lego piece called an amino acid, joins them all up together, which you see on the bottom in the colored bits, and that makes the protein. And the protein is what then has the function in the cell. Now, without going into the DNA sequencing technology, suffice it to say that when you get the result, it has a long code. Now, you'll know that there are codes called adenine, thymidine, guanine, cytosine, which is what those A, T, C, Gs are. And they don't have much meaning. And I, I want to just spend a little moment or two explaining the different types of mutations that can occur. And that's important because it's been shown that the type of mutation you have can influence how, um, how severe your disease may be. Now, but that doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to change that terminology to a wording sequence, which is called three letter words, as I said before, cat, sat, mat, hug the cat. That has real meaning now. We can understand what that code is saying and how it might influence the, our bodies. Now, when you have this coding, which is what it's meant to say, if you, ins if you change one letter, which you can see here on the left as a nonsense mutation, it says cat, maz, and now it doesn't, you can't, there's no Lego piece that's spelled M-A-Z. You can't get that. So what happens is the gene, when it's starting to be read to make the Lego pieces and put them together, it stops at this point. It just is nonsense. So you get completely no protein made. That's a loss of function of that protein. Now, remember it was said before that you get two copies. So of course the other one is still working, but you're now having a sort of deficiency but this nonsense mutation can, it's just not there. And if it's not there completely, it may not be having much effect on the normal function, or it could be having what we call a, a dominant uh, effect interfering with the function because you've got a little bit of the protein made and it's uh, disturbing the works. On the other side, if you get a missense mutation, which are the milder type of mutations, it says cat, sat, the mat, hug, cap. And now it's just giving you, telling you to do something else completely. It's a missense. It, you know, it may not have so much of a difference effect because the gene product is still able to function and work. Similarly, if we uh, if we look at the um, the cat 
uh, this terminology. Are you here for a duplication? It's suddenly the double negative. You know, cat sat mat, but not hug the dog. If is what you carry on reading the whole thing, it says, but not not the dog. So suddenly you're now turning one instruction into the opposite, and so it's changing it, or it may not make any difference. And then insertions is when you insert a word, and this now becomes what we call out of frame because it's shifted every three letter word along. So now it suddenly says cats, uh, blah, blah, blah. doesn't make any sense. So that again is a truncation that will stop working. That insertion will truncate the gene, just won't make any sense. So that's a very short but whistle stop tour into talking about mutations which can truncate the gene or which can just make a missense, a mild alter, a milder alteration to the gene. Now it's taken as many years to get to analyzing the genes for PKD. And it, we used to be very, very slow, but now we can run through panels and of genes, sometimes 300 genes, and we can do them in four weeks. And the NHS has gone away from looking at single genes or even gene panels, so just sequencing every gene in the body, but targeting down only those genes which are important. And we can do that now in, in, in weeks. And mainstreaming is coming along which means that non-genetics doctors, i.e. nephrologists uh, and possibly even GPs for some diseases can order genetic testing themselves. So now we're gonna get a lot more results and a lot more problems because there will be changes in genes that we don't understand. There will be changes in genes which look so similar to a normal sequence, which we compare it to, that we don't even recognize a spelling mistake for what it is. So it, testing in the future is going to be a challenge, but this is the biggest issue, which is called a variant sometimes of uncertain significance, where you know that you find a change in a gene and it's been seen before in lots of other polycystic disease families. Fine, that's clear. But you'll also get changes in the gene which are benign, which you've seen so many normal people, you know that that's irrelevant but sometimes you will see a change in a gene, which is called a variant of uncertain significance. You don't have enough affected people to be certain it's definitely the cause. You don't see it enough normal people to be confident that it's just benign. And so you define it as a variant of uncertain significance. And I think that some of those will eventually become definite mutations when we've tested enough people in the world with PKD or eventually we'll work out that this variation actually is a much, much milder presentation of the gene than we've seen in other people before. So it's still causing term damage, but it's a much milder onset. So, and as you saw before, there's definitely been three more genes found. There may be other genes to be found as well, and we're just looking in the wrong place. And that's why about five to 15% of individuals five to ten percent of individuals don't have a mutation they still have the condition they still have the disease we just can't confirm that it's caused by a mutation that we recognize and we've looked at pkd1 pkd2 and those other new genes so those individuals where you can't find a gene of course you then have to rely upon the old-fashioned ways as it were of diagnosing an individual which is using ultrasound criteria but obviously where there is a gene it's helpful because it gives you a confirmed diagnosis there are many other causes of cysts in the kidneys so i see quite a number now where they have a family history of diabetes and cysts in the kidneys and we know that that is a separate disorder called renal cysts and diabetes the distribution of the cysts is slightly different it's it's often a bit smaller the kidneys aren't bigger so there are some telltale signs. You don't just have to have a family history of diabetes, it can be absent even, but, but clinically you start to pick up differences. So if you can confirm a mutation in PKD1 or PKD2, you've got the diagnosis. You can then make some assumptions about prognosis, which we'll talk about. Um, and, but then there are some patients like these ones that have renal cysts and diabetes, where if you're not sure, they are good ones to test because you'll do the gene for PKD in the panel as well as you'll do the 
the, the gene for um, uh, renal cysts and diabetes called HNF1 beta. We, um, we've, I've got one patient who's very, very mild and has a gene deletion that spans two different disorders called PKD and tuberous sclerosis. And because it's such a small deletion, they don't manifest the full classical picture of either condition, but that explains why they may have two different disorders because the gene is expanding, deleted, spanning across two different genes, two different disorders. So genetics helps. If there's no family history, it can help you to be more certain. Predictive testing we talked about for younger individuals, because some of them might want to plan their life or plan their careers, particularly the military, or I have one person who's particularly wanting to become a pilot uh, in the military, and that would be a bar to him going into the military if he had PKD. So he's trying to plan what he does. Of course, one of the big issues I'm seeing now is patients who have live don't live want to be potential donors and clearly if they're younger they don't want to be giving a kidney if they've got a risk of developing pkd and having a genetic test where you know that the mutation in the family testing that individual you can then say definitely don't carry the gene there's no reason why you can't be a donor or definitely you carry the gene we can't recommend at any time that you be the donor and as again uh, i will come on to in a second or two uh, knowing the mutation helps you uh, calculate your risk score for prognosis in the future. Um, I think. Uh, Anna, doctor, can I just, yeah? can I jump in? Um, presumably, you, 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 you're going to talk a little bit about uh, spontaneous mutations. There's one or two questions about um, from people who have no existing family history. Um, but well, I'll, talk, I'll address happens. that now. And, and the answer is, you know, obviously, most often, 60 to 80% of the time, PKD has been inherited. But there are definitely a proportion of individuals where the mutation starts in them. And the way we, we try to make any diagnosis is by scanning the parents. Because if we see cysts in the parents, it establishes the dominant pattern of inheritance. But at the same time, it confirms that it's very, very likely to be dominant polycystic kidney disease. But yeah, I have enough, plenty of families where they don't have any cysts in either parent and it's not the recessive form of uh, polycystic kinases. It's got the picture and the hallmark of dominant PKD and there are what we call a new mutation. But once you have the mutation, you have a 50-50 chance of passing it down. And if the pat you don't have a mutation at all in the family that we can identify, but the pattern fits, you have a 50-50 chance of passing down whatever it is that you've got, but in this case, likely dominant PKD. Does that answer that question, Jane? It, it, it does, and there's a couple of people asking that, that similar question, which is if they are a genetic mutation, will they still pass, is there still the same sort of risk of passing it, off, uh, passing it on to, to offspring? And it works exactly the same, so the chances are 50-50. Correct. Yeah. Assuming you've got the diagnosis right and the pattern right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because, you know, one mustn't assume that every cyst is dominant PKD. But that's, that's why you go to a doctor. That's why we run inherited kidney disease clinics, uh, which I think I was one of the first to set up in the whole of the country, given my longstanding interest in PKD, which, as you was said by the previous speaker, is the commonest inherited kidney disease. So 60% of the people I see in that clinic are patients with polycystic kidney disease. So the number of cysts obviously can be used in a more definitive way with a, what they call a PPV, a positive predictive value, so 100%. So if you're young and you've got three, three or more cysts across either kidney, could be in one side or across two, you've got polycystic disease where there is a initial a priori, as we say, a, 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 a prior risk that you were 50-50 Going to inherit the gene. So if you're a family member of someone with dominant PKD and you're young and you've got three or more cysts, you have inherited the gene. And that's a you know quite a good test. So if you get to the age of 30 and you don't have any cysts at all, you can be pretty confident you haven't inherited it because you'd expect to have some. 97% sensitivity to have three cysts by the age of 30. So that's pretty good. Your chances of not having PKD will be very high if you have no cysts by the age of 30. 
and the number of cysts changes as you get older. And similarly on the right hand side, if you don't have the known gene in the family, it's still pretty good if you see cysts at a young age that you've got whatever the inherited cystic disease is in the family. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, genetics uh, and the influence on, the, on, on, on uh, survival and uh, survival to end stage kidney function, meaning dialysis. You know, there was a lot of work done looking at all the outcomes that were important, but one of the important outcomes that we wanted to include within it was the type of mutation. And if you were male, if you had high blood pressure before the age of 35, if you had a first, what they called urological event, that means pain in the kidney before the age of 35, a bleed or a cyst infection, one of those three, you'd get a certain number of points that you can see. If you then had a PKD2 mutation, which is the milder one, you remember, you didn't get any points, but if you had PKD1, which was non-truncating, so the protein was made, might have a different message, but you still got the full protein, that was less of a problem than if you had a truncated protein. And so you can see the scoring, uh, low to immediate to high, and you'll see on the graph that they were able to generalize and plot out that the survival was much worse to end stage kidney function if you were in the high risk group. If you look at this another way, you can see the low intermediate and high risk group, the median age, which is the exact midpoint between, there was many people above and below this age who had end stage function at 70 for the low risk, 56.9 for intermediate and 49.50 for the high risk. And these are the risks. Now, what's interesting is this middle one is exactly what we used to quote, that you had about a 50, 60% chance of having end stage renal function by the age of 59. So it's not far off. That was our classical type of uh, advice. But now with the genetics and the type of mutation, you can actually give someone a much better outlook uh, or unfortunately sometimes a much worse outlook if they have a truncating mutation. So these are things to think about, you know, before you get the genetic testing and the question being, do you want to know? But there's a huge degree of variability. Right, this again just exemplifies how if you concentrate here on the right bottom, the type of mutation dictates the age to end stage renal function. And if you have PKD2, you'll see here, you get to 80. So it's a much, much milder condition. And I know in certain areas, particularly with Dick Sanford in Cambridge, they use testing for PKD1 and PKD2 all the time in order to sort of give some guidance and good news, I suppose, um, that they got PKD2 and it's a milder condition. And I, I, the blue lines are drawn by me, these sort of diagonal lines, but this is the variability within families. This is, I get asked this question all the time. If it's been mild in my family, am I going to be mild as well? And the answer is we don't really know. We can't use that as a reliable measure. Each vertical line is one family and the individual members in it. And you'll see that from the red, which is severe to the blue, which is mild, each family has a huge variability. To my non-statistical eye, the only thing I would say is that if you have a protein truncation, the range of variability is much smaller than if you say have PKD, the non-truncating, the PKD2 or no mutation identified. So I think that that uh, makes a difference there. But it's, it's, we don't, you can't really rely on your family. You do have to follow all the advice which was given to try and maintain good kidney function, which means don't smoke ever, maintain optimum weight, really control your blood pressure as aggressively as you can, the lower the better without symptoms, and um, try to avoid things which cause a bleeding from the kidney, because we know that that's one of the influencing factors. Um, and and uh, drink lots and lots of water. And those are the main things that uh, we tend to recommend. Anan, can I just ask a question about that? How, what, what sort of things would avoid bleeding? Well, trauma. So, bleeding. Things which, so we tell people not to box, for instance, or to do an occ occupation which could uh, injure the kidney. Uh, punching them, you can have hugs and things, that's not the problem but it's more things that would be traumatic. And that's why, and dehydration would be a bad thing. And that's often why the problem with the military, because they 
you have to pass such aggressive tests that they really damage your body to some extent. Um, so drinking fluid, maintaining good blood pressure control, and trying to avoid um, uh, uh, damage to the kidney. Yeah. Um, bungee jumping is a bad idea for the same reason. Um, so should you have a genetic test? Well, yeah, we talked about confirming it. It might help you to know about PKD1 or 2. It will certainly help other members in the family uh, if they can decide for themselves whether they want to be tested. We talked about donor evaluation. We talked about how it might uh, make some treatment options available in the sense that it might make you more focused to actually, you know, monitor your blood pressure to really not eat salt, which is the other big thing, uh, which will try to reduce blood pressure and keep it lower. Uh, and also for those that want to use that information for family planning and testing and if, for those that might choose not to want to pass it down. Um, there are, I get asked, do people normally do it? Well, the answer is people are very different. It's an individual choice. Nobody is or should be judgmental about it. It's a choice between the couple to decide. And sometimes they don't agree even in the, amongst themselves, but it's their decision. And, um, and you don't have to have a mutation known to be entered into uh, receiving a tolvaptan. So it's an individual choice as to whether you wish to know. If you've got the clinical diagnosis, you always have to ask yourself, well, what will you do with the information? And if it will alter the information you give to your family or give you more comfort or more concern, these are things you need to take into consideration. There's a few cons there, the worry, the anxiety. Uh, if you have uncertainty about your diagnosis, uh, the risk to children, and obviously uh, knowing before you've got any symptoms. But with an adult onset condition that's, let's say, not going to manifest before the age of 30, a lot of my patients say, well, we've got one treatment, certainly now we've got others that we can do. Perhaps in 30 years time, there'll be even more. And I've had a very good quality of life. So I don't necessarily want to get testing for an individual. Now that's not a universal opinion. It's a big conversation and that's why genetic counseling is very important. Genetic counseling is non-directive. We don't tell you what to do. We give you the information and help you have a conversation about uh, trying to, how to take that information together and make a decision for yourself in a considered and timely manner. And it, I, I uh, it's just to finish on that point, I often get patients saying, ah, oh, but I, when I go there, I don't want to have a blood test. It's not what we do. You can come along, just have a chat, this kind of conversation we're having, and then go away without having any blood tests at all. And I'm just on that topic at the moment, there's quite a few questions coming through about potentially having your children tested. Yes. Uh, whether it's your teenager being screened, etc. So yes. it's just a good point there, just we were talking about genetic counselling perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I get asked that question a lot, should I test my children? Now, the, the, the sort of mantra always was that if, they, if there is a, uh, a um, no treatment, why would you want to di diagnose someone as it were? So if you're diagnosing them as it were using a genetic test, that's predictive testing. You don't have to declare that at the present time to the insurance companies. And that's a genetic test. It's not a clinical test. It's not, and it can stay out of your hospital notes. So you've got the information. Now, if you haven't discussed it with your child, and I do get some families saying, can't you just take the blood from him and not tell him what it is for? Well, sorry, no. Now, if they're 14, 15, they're old enough to understand they're having a blood test and you can't not tell them. So the, the bigger issue is why are you not having the conversation with them? The other side of it is, do you want to test a five-year-old? Well, the likelihood of a five-year-old having any problem whatsoever is very, very low. We don't really, we're not that good at measuring blood pressures in children under the age of 10. But I always say to the families, well, look, if you're not eating salt as a family, you check your child, let's say they're 10 years old, you check their blood pressure, it's perfectly all right. And, they don't have any evidence of any urine infections or other problems, i.e. unexplained fevers. They don't have pain and they've had no symptoms of blood or anything. Well, you could test the protein in the urine if you wanted, but if everything is normal, well, that won't make any difference to their management at that time. 
I don't, I'm not a headmaster. I'm not to tell people they can't, but it's a conversation to, to have to say, well, why are you testing? What difference will it make right now? And that's the question to ask. Yeah, if you want to plan more children, that's fine. Um, so there's, it's always yeah, no. a question of what will you do with the information. Thank um, you. Just thinking yeah. about time, um, just thinking about time, Anand. Um, yeah. In terms uh, of the, the actual presentation, if, if, do, you, do you have many more slides to no, go through? I'm just about finished. So I was just going to finish here to say that um, who will see the results, and this is about the confidentiality, because it's important when you're testing your children, it's not much value doing an ultrasound because if they're under 25, you can't really rely on it too much. So an ultrasound isn't necessarily the test. So a genetic test has its advantages, but also its disadvantages uh, because you've got to know what to do with the information. And then when will you tell your child and when will they tell their spouse or person, you know, do they tell them the day, first, day, first date or when they fall in love or I don't know, you know, there's all these issues you need to think about, but, You'll get to see your tests and you should ask for a copy of it. It will usually go to your GP unless you specifically write and say, I do not want it to go to my GP. I worry when it goes to GPs because it goes in the file. They don't necessarily treat it with the same confidentiality, particularly predictive testing. And if you're predictively tested and you're positive, even if your blood pressure is good and your everything else is normal, you get labeled as saying you've got no cysts even, but they label you as saying you've got polycystic kidney disease. Well, mm, they, they're at risk, but you know you don't know how bad they're going to be. You don't know what's what their future will hold. You get this label suddenly uh, of having a kidney disease, which pedantically is probably correct, but clinically it's not. So it allows you obviously to join research, and there are some advantages. So um, I think that um, that really summarizes it. Where if you're going to test children, you need to know the family mutation. You're most often doing it for diagnostic testing. You do need to think about the child's autonomy, ability to consent, and um, it may help some people focus their mind in adjusting their lifestyle and their family. Um, it is available through the NHS, of course, and, um, and that's where I would recommend referral. Um, it is being done more and more, and without a doubt, if there's any question of any problem in the child or pain or other problems, get the testing. I have no problem if there's a good reason and you shouldn't be stopped from doing that. And I know my colleague, Paul, at uh, GOS, he's many children who have symptoms. And of course, there should be no doubt at all about testing them. Um, I'm going to leave you at that, but I'm glad to say that in the new face of clinical management, they do recommend counselling. Sadly, there are still many, many patients with polycystic kidney disease who have never been told uh, to go and see a genetics doctor. And I think they should. Um, nephrologists, particularly if you have kidney, normal kidney function, are too busy to be seeing patients with PKD with normal kidney function, and they tend to sort of discharge them back to their GP. I did, admittedly, eight years ago, still have a patient come along who said my GP told me it was an infection and it would go away, which is very sad. But we're a lot better now. I think the PKD charity has done a huge amount of work in educating professionals as well as patients. But I'm going to stop at that point and maybe take some questions and things. Thanks, Anand. Um, quite a few questions here. I'm just sort of trying to sort of pick through them. So, so a quick question about polycystic ovaries. This lady's daughter's got polycystic ovaries but does not have PKD. It's suggested that there's a, there's a, a, a link to PKD. Is that correct? No, absolutely not. Nothing more to say on that. Straightforward answer. <laughs> Um, um, Martin, one of our volunteers, is asking about his nephew who was diagnosed with congenital hepatic fibrosis. Yeah. But also believes that that's related to PKD. Yes, it is much, much more classically associated with recessive polycystic kidney disease. So if the parents of the child don't have any cysts in their kidneys, they are a classic example of somebody who should get genetic testing for PKD and recessive forms. Uh, there have been some described PKD dominant patients who've had hepatic fibrosis. Um, I'm not sure we understand that, but why? But uh, the answer is that's a, they need to go and see a genetics doctor to sort out whether they've got recessive or dominant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just- I'm There were so many questions before. 
I know I'm just trying to, I'm just wading my way through this question here about connective tissue disorders. Yes. Uh, and, P I, and, and PKD1 gene. Yeah, I did answer that, I think. There are, I think I answered that much earlier on. There are lots of connective tissue elements to it, yes. Uh, this person has been told that they've got a mild genetic variation of PKD, or so they've been told. Mm. Uh, age 45, currently kidney function normal at present, but has many cysts on kidneys and, kidneys and liver. Anything to do to slow down progression? Well, as I said before, that if they, they can obviously try to get the gene mutation tested, which they seem like they have done. Um, if they want to go and see a genetics doctor, they can try and define how mild is mild. They've obviously got that other information I gave about the prognostic indicators. Um, if they know the type of mutation they have, and it, they should be available to them if they get a copy of the report. But obviously, it's the things I said before, you know, maintain your blood pressure lower, don't eat salt eat a normal amount of protein, don't go to steaks and eat those massive porterhouse steaks, which are nothing but pure meat all day. And most people in Britain have a starvation diet when it comes to meat anyway. But I think uh, it's just uh, being sensible with your diet, um, avoiding salt, drink lots of fluid, don't smoke, maintain optimum weight, make sure you know your cholesterol. Yeah. And another question, I think you thought you'd answer live. It's a lady who is 80, PKD diagnosed in her early 20s. Mm. Her GFR is greater than 60 until she was 47 and became unwell. She's recently received a second diagnosis of MPGN. Apparently it's very rare. Yes, so that's a very interesting one. I think that's another one that should go to the, the genetics doctors or I don't know where she lives, but I'd be very interested to see her. But uh, the answer is that she could have a second diagnosis, uh, you know, uh, it's not impossible. PKD is in that sense common. Um, was it inherited, the PKD? Sorry, that lady. It doesn't say, unfortunately. What I'm just typing a little message to the lady yeah. to say perhaps she could contact us directly and we could yeah. perhaps forward her details to yourself, Anna. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, if it's inherited, then she was at 50% risk anyway. So she can, you know, just because you got PKD doesn't mean you can't get any other kidney disease for whatever reason you get it. It's just very bad luck. But the thing to do is make sure you're not missing an alternative diagnosis, particularly if she's the first one. And it's just cysts is a manifestation in part of that other condition. Thank you. Question here. Um, one, of, one of this lady's family members has been gene tested and knows their gene information. Mm. Does that mean that, that her um, sort of gene inf or gene makeup is exactly is identical? Well, which family member, I guess. Yeah, well, if it's a first degree relative, then that means brother, sister, mother, father, uh, child, then she's going to have 50% of the genes are similar. But if the gene mutation is known, then it's a simple matter to test that individual for the known mutation in the family. And the NHS will do that, providing we can get the information from their relative and they're willing to share it. And this, quest, this person's asking, can some variants of PKD1 cause higher risk of circle of Willis or brain aneurysm stroke than other PKD1 variants? Ah, oh, good question. The answer is we've been searching for many, many years and there's still no absolutely clear um, association with any one particular mutation type or even PKD1, PKD2 with aneurysms. The general population risk of an aneurysm is about 2%. And in PKD families, it's an empiric risk of about 6%. Um, but if you have a known family history of a, a definite subarachnoid or a definite aneurysm, then your risk uh, of having an aneurysm is about 12%. So it's still not fantastically high. And if there is a risk, we have a long conversation with the individuals as to whether they want to know, because not all of them would be operable, whether they can live with that sort of ticking time bomb type of sensation, and also the frequency of screening, the onset of new symptoms that they should watch out for. But fundamentally, if they're worried, we'll suggest five yearly MR, MR angiograms. And I have one chap who is, uh, again, back to being a pilot, and he's a commercial pilot, and they still allow him to work because as a commercial pilot, you never fly alone. And uh, they scan him every year and they're very happy. I'm not gonna tell you the airline company. 
<laughs> Thank you. I think we're, we're, we're actually out of time now. We're, we're kind of, we're, we're in danger of becoming significantly overrun. Um, I think, can, can I suggest that anybody that's got any questions, if, if, you, if you email us, um, and we'll do our very best to, 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 to get the answers and come back to you. Um, Susan, what do you want them? Do you, would you like prefer sort of info at? Perfect. If anyone comes through to info at, and we can sift through them and get them to the appropriate person. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'm whittling through a couple here, such as preeclampsia and liver. These are very, very interesting topics. Today we don't have the specific specialists for them, but we're delighted that we're having a series of mini live events in January. So we will be covering pregnancy and, P and PLD in January. And details of these events are on our website now. Okay. Fan fan fantastic. Thank you. Um, and we, we are going to have to um, wave goodbye to you. Um. Not forever, obviously. Um, th thank, you, th thank you so much. And um, we're, once again, and we, as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll do our very best. If everybody sort of sends in their questions to info at pkdcharity.org.uk, we'll do our very, very best to, 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 to get the answers. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of chase up um, Dr. Cigar and, uh, and, and come back to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Anand. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. So we're now going to take a quick break. We're actually sort of ending a little bit later than scheduled, but we'll, we'll be back at 12.